Welcome to my talk about CRLite revocation for X509 certificates in the browser, this time for real. Um, the title already kind of induces that revocation is an important matter when we're handling certificates and that it is not quite working well right now. And I want to show you a bit why this is a problem and what the new proposed solution called CRLite is. Uh, as a little background, why I chose this subject and why I'm interested in this matter. <clears throat> I'm working as a security cult consultant for SBA research now since last year. But prior to that, I have spent a couple of years working as a security officer for an Austrian certification authority. So a company which produced and sold certificates. So I know this matter by heart and from the inside and I know what the problems are the real setting and I'm still quite interested in that matter and that's why I'm following it when I, and I'm always keen to learn new de developments in the field. So let's start with the sad story of revocations. I want to tell you in this why revocation, what revocation is, why it is necessary and what the problem with the currently used solutions are. A uh, quick introduction, I'm more or less assuming that you kind of know this because otherwise you probably wouldn't be listening to a talk on a very specific uh, certificate subject, but just for a recap so that we all can all start on the same page. Revocation is something that's not around in the world cryptography for a long time. It only arose with asymmetric cryptography, which was developed in the public world at least in the late 70s and early 1980s. Um, so we have we had asymmetric cryptography. The subject now creates a public-private key pair. Um, now a new need arises, which was not not present in the older field of symmetric cryptography. We want to create a trust relation between the public key of the key and the metadata, the identification, the, which identifies the owner of that key. That's why. Certification authorities and certificates were invented. A certificate is just a public key uh, with, with a cryptographic bound metadata information telling, telling me some information about who, who owns this key and how it should be used. Uh, one of the oldest lessons in cryptography that, that the, the world has learned was <clears throat> that keys should not be used for too long. If I use one cryptographic key for too many operations, it becomes weaker and an attacker gets more material to work with trying to crack the key. So after a, f after a few months, weeks, years, depending on the scheme that you're using, the key should be in one. That's why every certificate that we're using has a validity period. Uh, the length of this period is usually measured in years for mostly organizational and commercial commercial matters because the CAs can make more money if they sell sell you a longer lived certificate. Um, but this creates a new problem. We have a certificate which is valid for say five years, but of course in these five years a lot can a lot can happen and a lot can happen which would make the use of this certificate insecure. Um, the most prominent examples are, of course, broken algorithms or a key compromise. Broken algorithms, if you think of the hashing algorithms SHA-1 and MD5, which have been, have been deprecated in the previous 10, 15 years, they were both used very widely in certificates and they must not be used anymore. So any certificate using one of these algorithms should have to be invalidated, even before its uh, usual validity per period expires. Key compromise is also a big thing and a big, um, a big reason why revocation is necessary. If, I, if the subject ever, use, ever loses the, the sole uh, property of the private key or the password uh, securing it, then the key is, co is considered compromised because other people can use it and the certificate must not be used anymore. Um, I can tell you while these two things are the most the, the thing that most people think about when when they hear revocation, they are not the rule and they actually in the real world hardly exist. 
um, nine, about 99 percent of all revocations happening in the real world are due to organizational problems ranging from I forgot the password for my private key and can't use it anymore please make a new one to my company changed name or the, the employee who used the certificate doesn't work for us anymore we need a new certificate so that's the real reason why I said why but of course the compromising is very important so to sum, sum it up revocation is just a mean to tell the world that a certificate has become invalid before its expiration date so how can we achieve this the first thing that was used and probably the most well-known thing are the certificate revocation lists or crls it's just what the name says it's a list of all certificate identifiers which have been by the certificate already, alongside with a date and maybe some other metadata and signed and signed by the CA so that um, the recipient of the CRL can, can validate the signature and thus can be sure that uh, the certificates are actually revoked by the CA. That works basically well, so it does what it, it does what it, what it should do, but the problem is that these lists can become really large over time especially for large certification authorities for global enterprises and you must measure their size in megabytes which doesn't sound too much when you hear it for the first time but if you think about that every time your browser does make a tls connection to an https server for every server that you're contacting you would have to load, download a few megabytes prior to ma actually making the the connection that would that would uh, introduce quite a lot of latency into your browsing experience and is thus unacceptable that's why browsers don't use them um, a couple of years later the friendly people at the ietf tried to develop a, a new protocol trying to solve this problem because what i what I actually need when I'm opening a TLS connection is I don't care for a list of all revoked certificates by the CA. I'm only caring for exactly one certificate, that certificate of the cert that the server is using I'm trying to connect to. So all the mega those megabytes of data are of, are of no interest to me. So that's why the OCSP protocol was developed, the Online Certificate Status Protocol, which is a very simple thing. I'm sending a request, hey, I for the CA, some some name i want to know if the certificate with the serial number one two three four five has been revoked or not and the server responds with a cryptographically signed response saying yeah certificate has been revoked or no certificate is still valid and now I'd, this is this is a lot faster of course because i don't need to transfer megabytes through the wire but only a few kilobytes Uh, from a per performance perspective, this solves our problem, but it introduces two new problems, unfortunately. The first are privacy concerns. Because with a CRL, I'm just downloading the whole list and the CA doesn't know which certificate I'm actually interested in. But if I contact the CA for a specific certificate, this of course tells this, this certification authority exactly which certificate I'm trying to validate and thus, and which is equivalent with the domain I'm trying to access in my web browser. So if I want to bombbilling.com, then the CA who, who signed the certificate of bombbilling.com now knows exactly at which time my IP address tried to access this website, which is a, can be problematic, of course. Um, the second problem, which is actually the bigger one was that it didn't really work in the in a, in a browser because and as long as the browser gets the response everything is fine but what happens if the OCSP server is not reachable doesn't send the response or a timeout occurs this can be because the server is down this can be because an attacker is blocking access to the OCSP server so now the browser has to decide what to do in this in such a situation there are two two possibilities um, you can do a hard failure or a soft failure. Hard failure means no response from the OCSP server, means certificate is considered invalid, no TLS connection. Soft failure means, okay, no response. I'm just assuming that the certificate is valid and I'm letting it through and maybe I'm trying again in a few minutes. Um, 
the problem is that both of these approaches are not really usable because the hard failure just introduces a huge single point of failure because an attacker would just need to take down a single OCSP server of a large CA and with this one attack could take down millions or tens of millions of websites if it's a, it is a large CA. And the soft failure is actually rather useless because you only need, if, if an attacker tries to, tries to forge a server for you, he's going to block the OCSB access for you so that you cannot check the revocation status. Um, Adam Langley of the security team of Google, who's writing a lot of these things about these matters, uh, once compared a soft failure with a safety belt in a car which snaps every time that the car crash occurs. So it's making it quite pointless. Um, yeah, and an additional problem is that um, actually doing this OCSP protocol from a CA perspective is quite expensive. I've given you a number on the sheet from Komodo from 2013, so quite a while ago. They already serve 2 billion requests per day. That's really a lot. And, and since the responses need to come fast and really fast, that's very expensive for CAs to do. Um, okay, how could we try to remedy this problem? Um, one proposed solution is OCSB stapling, which has the quite interesting twist that actually it doesn't matter if I contact the OCSP server or the web server it itself does it because the, the OCSP response is cryptographically signed by the certification authority. So it is quite possible that the, the web server is just requesting the OCSP response, telling, hey, my certificate is okay and sending it to me alongside with the TLS handshake. Um, this solves the privacy problem because I never contact the OCSP server directly. Um, it solves the performance problems for the CA because not every, every person or every browser contacting the website needs to contact the OCSP server, but just the web server is doing it once every five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever the duration of the OCSP responses are, taking, taking off a lot of strain from the servers. Uh, problem is that is, this is not mandatory. The, the web server might send the stapled OCSP response or it might not do it, so I cannot uh, depend on it. Second problem, and an attacker might of course block it in the TLS handshake, which again gives me, a, gives me the same problem like with soft failure. Um, second big problem that are, have gotten better in recent times, but have plagued the field for quite a long time is that the implementations in the web server, uh, especially for Apache, were really, really bad and didn't work very well. Um, that's why while OCSP stapling is a great technology, has not been, is not used very widely. Um, a solution to this, a proposed solution to the matter of uh, the server might not send it is the OCSP must staple extension. It's a certificate extension, which can be included in X509 certificate. And if this, it just says, if this extension is present in the certificate, then the certificate is only valid for TLS handshakes if the handshake from the server is, does include a stapled OCSP response. Great thing, would solve our problem. Again, it's not widely implemented, not widely used. I, cannot really tell you why it's there is not have not been done more effort to give it wide um, give it a wide adoption but that's that's the state of the art that we have right now and it's just not used okay um since all of revocation doesn't really work that well oh i forgot to say one important cause of all this uh, revocation not working very well because CRLs are too large and OCSPs don't work well. Um, modern browsers simply do not use revocation. That's something that most users are not aware of. But if you're using a modern instance of Chrome or Firefox or whatever, then chances are that the revocation status of the certificate you're, you're trying to access is never actually checked in the browser. So we're doing a lot of effort to provide this service, but no one is using them. Yeah, so the browser thought, okay, Revocation, like we know it is not working, what could we do to work around the problem? And there are two solutions which have been tried. And the first is um, browser-based revocation lists. No, they don't really have a common name. One CRL is the Mozilla name, if I remember correctly. CRL set is 
what Google is calling it. Microsoft calls it a certificate trust list. Don't know what, what Apple calls it, but it's all basically all the same thing. They work just like a certificate revocation list, so a list of revoked certificates, but not, um, but not just for one certification authority, but for all certification authorities out there. Of course, having a full list of this would be way too large. And so that's why this, these lists are reduced to high value domains, whatever that means. Um, the idea for, for, the, for, the, for those browser-based certification uh, revocation lists came when the Digi, DigiNota incident happened in 2008. Um, some of you might have heard it. Um, it's kind of like the, the main example that everyone gives for, for bad CA practice. DigiNota was a small Dutch certification authority uh, run by the government originally, but it was included in all the trust stores of all the applications, operating systems and browsers. And they were completely pwned in 2008. We don't really know by whom. Assumption is that it was some sort of Iranian secret service. There was some, uh, some hints that pointed in that direction. And they issued publicly trusted certificates for domains like gmail.com and windowsupdate.com, so really high value targets. And if you're using a modern browser now, all those certificates are all already included in the browser as being revoked. So that's a, good, it's a, that's a good method that works, but doesn't scale to the whole of the internet, of course. The second workaround that has been used in the past is short certificates. This was popularized by Let's Encrypt, actually, which issues just three months certificates and doesn't even have longer certificates. Um, on the other hand, that the classic commercial CAs used to issue TLS certificates, which were valid for quite a, a long years, sometimes up to 10 or usually five years was, was, the, was the norm a few years ago. Um, there's the CA Browser Forum, which is an inter-industry discussion board, which issues the baseline requirements, which are the de facto standard that all the CAs and uh, browsers have to operate against, or the, min the minimum standards they have to, have to operate against. And they already introduced lifetime reductions from five years to three years and currently to two years. And they tried to reduce it to one year last year, but the ballot failed in the forum. Um, the browsers were all for it. The CAs, which have the majority, obviously, were mostly against it for commercial reasons. Um, an interesting development is that earlier this year, Apple announced that it was going forward with this anyway, unilaterally. So they are just not going to accept any certificates longer for than one year, um, starting next year, I think, in the, in the Safari browser, which is a quite interesting development because it might very well kill the CA browser forum. But that's a different matter and what would yeah, lead too far here. Um, why is this interesting to reduce the lifetime of certificates? it doesn't solve actually the revocation problem because the certificate might still be compromised, but it reduces just the time span when an attacker could exploit uh, a key that he, that he has compromised. So if a certificate is valid for five years and an attacker gets hold of the private key shortly after the, the issuance of the certificate, he has, a, he has a duration of five years to exploit the, the certificate. If it's only valid for three months, like a Let's Encrypt certificate, you can only misuse it for three months. Then a new key gets generated, a new certificate gets generated, and the problem goes away. Um, there are even people advocating that, um, that the three months are too long. And since we already have an automated issuance process in place, thanks to Let's Encrypt, we could very certificate valid for a week or even only a few days. Yeah, so to sum the set story of revocation up, um, revocation in the web PKI is pretty weird. It's the really most complicated part when you want to operate at a certification authority due to legal and standard requirements. It's the most expensive part. That's why cert commercial certification authorities charge you quite a lot of money for a certificate, mostly because of the revocation they have to handle. But on the other hand, it's currently completely broken. It's unused. Uh, Scott Helmy, who some of you might have heard, um, security consultant and blogger who, who is um, working a lot in the certificate field, 
has recently made a made a self experiment where he just blocked all revocation based uh, traffic from his home network and tried to see if anything breaks and he said no I've, I've, I've absolutely everything that i used worked just the same with no revocation traffic coming through so it's completely unused so consuming a lot of effort but not really important uh, one thing that i need to mention at this point um, i use the, the term web pki here that's important because i'm only talking about tls based certificates now there are a lot of other usages for certificates out there, especially document signatures like code signatures or e-government, but those have quite a different set of requirements and problems when it comes to revocation. So I'm strictly speaking about certificates for TLS now. Okay, so much for the long introduction. Let's come to the actual matter of this talk, which is CLite, which is a new proposed solution to the problems that I sketched. And I'm going to show you what it's about, why it's interesting, and why it could actually work. Um, it's a relative new thing. It was proposed as an academic paper on the IEEE Security and Privacy Summit three years ago by Laris Chofnes et al. <clears throat> um, the idea behind it is simple. It just tries to expand on the idea of one CRL, so compiling a list of a browser-based list of revoked certificates but this time trying to do it with all certificates that are out there, not, not just the high value ones. Um, if you listen closely before, I already said that this is not plausible to do for all certificates because the, the size of this list would be much too large. But um, those researchers said, okay, we can actually do it if we don't just store it as an ordinary list, but if we use a clever uh, data storage structure called cascading bloom filters. Uh, if this were a real talk where I could see any of you, I would ask you what's your knowledge on bloom filters is and to, to check how much into detail I have to go. Um, unfortunately, I cannot do this now on the web. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction what bloom filters are. I'm not going to, to tell you how they actually work. If you're inter interested in this, maybe I can expand a bit about it in the questions afterwards. But now I we'll just want to give you, tell you the basic properties of that because that's all you need to understand to understand how CRLite works. Um, so they are a data storage structure. They don't actually store the data, but then they are storing an index. So if we put an object in the filter, an index of this object is stored and we can later try to check is the object in the filter or is it not in the filter. Uh, objects can only be added to the filter. They can never be removed. And it's extremely space, space efficient. And so we can use, really store a lot of data in such a bloom filter, um, needing but only requiring very little storage space. The price that we pay for this, for this efficiency is that it's not a deterministic data structure. So we cannot say for sure if an object is in it or not. The only answer that the filter is giving us, if we say, is this object in the filter, is it's a, it tells us object is not in the filter for sure, or object is probably in the filter. So we can know for sure if an object is not in it, but when it tells us that an object is in it, we can, we can only be so sure, not completely sure. Uh, the probability of such a false positive depends on a few parameters, of course. The large, they are quite obvious. The larger the filter is, the smaller this, this false probability rate becomes. And the more items we try to stuff into the filter, the larger this probability becomes. It's quite obvious. Um, so what is CLI doing and how is it using uh, the Bloom filters? <clears throat> Sorry. The first thing it is doing is it's downloading all CRLs for all uh, CA certificates stored in its trust store, compiling a list of all certificate identifiers that are revoked and storing these identifiers in such a Bloom filter. So, and if a certificate get checked now, I can look into this Bloom filter, is the certificate revoked or not? If it's not in the filter, the certificate is not revoked. I can be for sure. But if it's in the filter, it can still be false positives. So it could be a certificate that is perfectly valid, but the filter just tells me it is in the revoked list. So I need to control for these false positives. Um, and now I need to mention a different, rather new technology in the certificate world that is called certificate transparency. Um, it's a public log where every certification authority for the last five years or so 
has to log all the certificates that it issues. Otherwise, they are not considered valid by the browser. So what we're having here, which is great, we have a list of all certificates that are out there. So now we can find out all the false positives because we can just check all the certificates against our filter, find out all, all false positives, and then we're storing this list of false, of false positives in a second Bloom filter. That's why it's called a cascading filter because we're using multiple filters where at, at each level the filter gets a lot smaller because we only need to store the false positives. The second filter can have false positives again, again, again as well, but the size, the number of those false positives is, must be a lot smaller. So we're storing these false positives the false positives in a third filter. And if there are still some, some available, we're doing, using a fourth, a fifth filter, as long as, and we're doing this until no false positives are available anymore. So we, so we can, so what we're doing with these cascading bloom filters, we have multiple levels of filters, which become smaller at each level, and we can store absolutely every revoked certificate in them and control for all false positives of all certificates that are currently out there. So is this used? Um, kind of. It is pushed by Mozilla mostly. They have already implemented it for the Firefox browser. It is used in the Firefox nightly builds, what, although only for telemetry, not for actual revocation checking right now. They are building a new filter four times a day because, of course, new certificates come in, uh, come, come in every minute, so we have to recheck for the false positives. Um, they are covering a really lot of certificates. They are covering 100 million of the 152 million certificates that are out there in the publicly available certificate transparency logs. Um, they are handling 750,000 revocations. Um, the discrepancy of the 52 million missing certificates, which are not, not handled by CRLite yet, is due to the fact that some CRLs simply have errors, are erroneous. But the biggest problem is that not all, not all certificates are actually publishing a CRL because they're not used anyway. They are, they are saving their, their, their efforts here. Uh, biggest example is Let's Encrypt, which only uses OCSP at the moment. But if CR, this is a problem that is absolutely solvable. If CRLite actually catches on and can, becomes the standard, then Let's Encrypt will just publish a CRL. That's not a problem. That is unsolvable. The filter generation is actually pretty fast. Mozilla says it takes about an hour on a standard server hardware requiring 16 gigabyte of RAM and seven gigabyte of, of storage space. So that's doable on a standard server. No problem. <clears throat> and this is the most important number of the whole thing. The whole list of all 750,000 revoked certificates as a, oops, as a Bloom filter only takes storage space of about 1.3 megabytes. That's about two bytes per revoked certificate, which is pretty amazing. And of course, one, one megabyte is a size that is very small and which can easily be pushed to your browser four times a day without the bandwidth becoming a problem on any standards. PC or mobile phone. Yeah, and also important is it's a lot faster than OCSP in most cases. They said in 99% of all cases, it was a lot faster for checking the revocation than OCSP was, which is also not very surprisingly because yes, you don't have, have to do any network traffic and you just have to check in, in the list that is already in your memory. Okay, so that's, that's what CLite is. A few references at the end, if you want to dig deeper into the matter, the, the first one is the research paper that introduced the idea of CRLite. Then there's a blog series by Mozilla where they're explaining what they're doing and why they're doing it. It's part two and three. It's quite interesting with some nice flowcharts. Uh, I already mentioned Scott Helmy. He already wrote a night blog post for about CRLite. And then there are two older blog posts. Uh, the first one is by Adam Langley of Google where they have explained why revocation is actually broken and not used in modern browsers at the time. So, and this concludes my talk. Key takeaways, certificate revocation, the browser is completely broken, but it's still kind of important and we should fix it. Uh, pushing list of revoked certificates was the only thing in the past that has shown to actually work. And we're leveraging this and expanding on it with the interesting data structure of Bloom filters. And an honorary, honorary mention goes to certificate transparency, which is an enabling technology for this. If it wasn't for certificate transparency, 
we couldn't have a, we wouldn't have a list of all certificates out there and couldn't check for false positives and the whole scheme would just not work yeah thank you for listening in um if you if you want to contact me have any further questions you have my email address here and i will gladly take questions after that